Good morning to all our Foreigners viewers. Uh, welcome here. We have On The Line with, and today we are speaking to one of the gurus of specimen fishing, um, Gilbert Foxcroft. Gilbert, welcome here with us today, and uh, please enjoy the interview with us. Hi, Werner. Uh, yes, it's great to be with you, and uh, yeah, it's under, under extraordinary circumstances, uh, sitting at lockdown, I'm sitting in my garage and you're sitting at home in your office. Uh, yes, it is. So uh, what have you been busy with? We are on the fourth day of lockdown. It's Monday morning and uh, the office has been busy on a virtual level um, with our morning meetings and everything with our staff. Nobody's here, but we are busy. Um, so what have you been busy with today? Well, um, first and foremost, I think I had the time um, in the last couple of days to to get to um, make contact with all the, the guys out there on social media, uh, show the guys a couple of video clips on how to do certain things that they've been asking me about. I've been tying rigs, I've been doing lead systems, I've been, uh, I've been trying to get some exercise done. Um, and yeah, I think uh, the next thing is uh, tomorrow we'll have to do a bit of gardening. So yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot of things and uh, and uh, yeah, mommy is keeping the thumbs down and uh, make, making sure that all the things that we haven't been able to do um, up until now, we do have to get and make some time to do that. Oh, that's great. But we are actually quite fortunate um, with technology so that we are able to do some work um, to get some of the things done that we haven't been able to and to share that with all our viewers um, all the time. Correct. It's, it's yeah. a great privilege and we are so blessed to be able to do that. Yes, for sure. Um, you know, the thing is, um, you, you don't really get to uh, understand how busy one actually gets during the normal uh, hustle and bustle of, of, of the day. Um, you know, people ask, you know, when you, when you get time, do us a video clip on, uh, on how you put a spinner rig together. Um, what sort of bait presentation do you use, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, you d just don't get the time. I mean, I get, I get home at six o'clock in the evening, then it's time for dinner. And by the time you've had dinner, you just don't want to do anything other than, you know, uh, finish off what you, what, you would, what you set out to do during the day. Now for me, my normal day is I visit all the tackle shops. I get orders from them during the day and I get home and then I process all those orders. So um, by 10, 11 o'clock at night, I'm still busy processing orders and emailing it through to, to, the, to the office so that tomorrow morning, eight o'clock, when they switch their computers on, um, you know, they are ready to um, do the picking slips and send out the pro formas, et cetera, et cetera. Well, under these circumstances, it's like a blessing in disguise to sort of almost like a reset button that, uh, yes. that nature has given us. So uh, let's make the best of it and uh, let's talk. Um, but first, before we ask you some interesting questions, I've got two, su two surprises for you. Yeah. And um, whatever comes into your mind when you see this, start talking. Yes. Well, 2005. Um, that's uh, uh, it's a Nin Dam. That fish was 39 pounds, 14 ounces. Uh, it's a session that me and uh, Big Yaku did with my dad, and uh, yeah, it was it was uh, you know uh, a, a rough time. The dam was not at a really great level, and uh, we lost a serious amount of fish because our feature finding wasn't good enough. The echo sounder that we had in those days wasn't. Um, able to pick up the, the, the smaller snags that were sitting on our left hand side and we literally lost the first 18 fish that we hooked and at, at some other stage I hooked a catfish during the night, brought it in and quickly went and uh, put it out but I, at this time I went into one of the channels where the, the hippos were cruising about during the day. And I literally got back to the bank and I got another drop back and I thought, damn, you know, this is another catfish. And I pulled, you know, really, really pulled hard and bullied that fish all the way until I saw the yellow tail. And then it was like everything went, <laughs> you know, what, what am I going to do now? You know, I've got the drag loose and everything. I nearly slipped and fell into the dam. 
uh, everyone had a great laugh. But yeah, that was that was good time. Okay, and what about this one? Oh, practice session 2010. Um, that was Brazenos 2. Uh, Loki and I sat on um, a fairly difficult swim. And luckily, oh, oh, well, it was, it was overcast, as you can see on the picture. Um, and the, the most amazing thing was, at some other stage, the clouds lifted and the sun came through. And as the sun came through, we actually saw exactly where all the, um, where all the weed beds were. And we cast our marker float into one of those pockets and it went donk onto the bottom. Got our rigs together, cast it out, and it was literally minutes. We started catching all these amazing Brazenos 2 fish, which was really, really special. And the fish that I had after that one was a fish of almost 35 pounds, which in, in, in those days, in 2010, that would have been, as far as I understand, the lake record for Brazenos too. So yeah, it was, it was really awesome memories. Oh, that's great. And um, it was great for me to bring you back to a little bit of the old times. Uh, yeah, nostalgia. Yeah, maybe I can send you the two, these two frames and you can put them up somewhere in your house. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so first question. We are going to a new venue that we've never, never been before. How do I prepare? Well, I think first and foremost is to check on social media, speak to your mates, find out as much as possible as you, that you can about the venue. How deep is it? What sort of structure is there? Is it a gravel? If it, is it predominantly gravel? Is it predominantly clay? Is it predominantly sand or silt or whatever the case might be? And that obviously then determines whether I'm going to be, am I going to be fishing out far or am I not going to be fishing out far? So. Um, you know, obviously I want to try and catch the biggest possible fish that I can. So I would go with the strongest possible tackle that I can. And um, one, of the, one of the spools I've got here is, um, oh, there goes my dog. Um, one of the spools I've got here is my Emblem 45, and I've got it actually loaded up with 18 pound uh, uh, contour fluorocarbon. Um, but my other spools, if I can just take this one out here, this is the Emblem 45, and it's actually filled up with 750 meters of 30-pound J-Braid. So what I would normally do, I would make sure that I first and foremost try and find out whether I'm going to have to cast or whether I have to go and drop my, my lines. If I have to cast, there's no need for the braid. Um, I would pure and simply fish the fluorocarbon straight through. If it is a venue like when uh, Neville and I fished Borneo Lake, where we had to literally cast um, up to 135 meters, then I would take out my, my Bayesia um, setup, and I would, and the Bayesias are loaded up with eight pound Daiwa sensor line, and I've got a 40 pound um, J braid leader on. There I can cast to literally wherever I, I need to go. Um, the, the other thing that I, that I normally try and find out is, is there a big head of catfish? Because if there's catfish, I don't necessarily want to touch the boilies. Because if I go the boilie route, normally for some other reason, and I think it's the, it's the, the, the egg proteins in the boilies that, that, that the catfish latches onto. And that's something that we've learned over the years. Um, so I wouldn't go with all my eggs in one basket. I would go with a variety of rigs. I would have um, the loops and booms. I'll have spinner rigs. I'll have, I'll, I've, I've always got ready my choddies and stuff like that because a lot of times people uh, leave the margins alone and they always want to go and fish on the furthest end of the lake that they can, which is not always the best um, thing to do. Um, sometimes you catch all your fish at 30 meters from the bank. Um, and, and, and it's so crazy to, to hear how people actually, when they get to a lake, the first thing they do is they go right to the opposite bank. And everyone that's sitting on that opposite bank wants to fish this opposite bank. So why not just fish the margins or just fish the contours and the structures? Okay, so how do I prepare um, without having the necessary stuff, but without having a lot of clutter. I'm quite a technical angler, and uh, my biggest fear at the, at the water is always that I don't have 
whatever I need. Um, but how do I get through that so that I don't need two traders to get my stuff? Well, first and foremost, like, like I've just shown you, I've got spools that's filled up with uh, a contour fluorocarbon and I've got spools that's filled up with braid. When I get to the lake, the very first thing that I do is I do my feature finding. Um, and obviously with, with this tool here, the Laurence Elite 9 Ti2, I don't need to use a marker float. I can actually go out. First and foremost, I, I create a waypoint called home. And then I go and I spend some time on the water. And then I de determine by just seeing what I see on the screen and how the contours actually develop as I map the area that, I, that, I, that I'm fishing at. Um, I then determine, am I going to be using braid or am I going to be using fluorocarbon? Am I going to drop my baits or am I going to fish from the bank? In other words, cast from the bank. Um, Obviously, dropping a line from the boat gives you a lot more critical positioning. It, it gives you an, an opportunity of presenting a bait absolutely superbly. Um, in South Africa, we all know that the majority of the lakes, you're going to be fishing with particles, and that is the most uh, um, effective. So I would always take with me dry particles, so that I can prep them at the dam. And whatever I don't use, I bring back home. My particles would normally consist of maize, broken maize, hemp, and tiger nuts, and not huge quantities of them either. Uh, we've proved that last year when you were with us at the, on the Hirgan on Salveer shoot, um, we literally put one uh, bucket mixed particles out every single day, and we spread it over a very wide area. And the whole purpose of that was not to get the fish into a feeding frenzy. We actually wanted them to be preoccupied so that they could remain in the swim for a longer period. So first and foremost, I don't take a huge amount of rods. I would, I would take my four rods, of which I will be fishing three rods. So one rod is always spare. If I see a fish jump, I would cast to that fish and I would take another rod out so that I have got space on my um, single setup. What else? Um, if I need to spawn, I will have a spawn rod ready. I've always got my marker rod with me. My, my tackle box literally consists of just the basic, basic necessities. All the extra stuff, my extra hooks, my extra bits and pieces, I leave that at home because my tackle box is literally packed with just whatever I need to, um, to get through that period. Now, we learned last year on the Irgan on Salveer, we used 18 rigs and we had 119 runs and we landed all 119 fish. The, the success rate, and, and that's where confidence also comes in. So I don't need to take a lot of rigs. Um, lead systems, I would literally have, if I'm going to be dropping my baits, I'll, I'll literally have a drop of lead system. Or if I'm going to be casting, I would have my helicopter system. And with me being able to move that bead up, I can actually cast into the thickest of salt and I'll still be able to present a bait properly. And we all know that carp love salt. And a lot of people actually avoid that. They actually wanna fish the harder areas. Whereas I would look for those interception areas, that, that, that interception lines between the hard and the soft because that's the lines where the fish uh, obviously patrol, they won't find bloodworm on the gravel. They'll find the bloodworm in the silt. The same with the little snails and the same with, with all the little crustaceans that you find, you find them in the silt. So therefore I'll always have pre-prepared uh, choddy rigs. I'll have spinner rigs with uh, two different lengths, normally a five and a half inch or a seven and a half inch. And I'll have a variety of leads. So if I need to cast, I can use the casting leads, or if I need to drop a bait and I've got to drop the lead, then I've got that available. So one crate will contain all of those bits and pieces, so I don't have any major clutter, and I can be light enough. Now with the Conqueror trailer to, to my disposal, you know, I can just flip the, the, um, the tent part up, and I can be on my way and move to the next spot. And that's, that's, the, the, that's the next evolution 
um, in, in our game is the fact that if you can do it uh, quickly and you can, and you can uh, be on the move to follow the fish, you've got a better chance of catching them. Okay, so, so you've got two crates, that's it. Um, one crate with baits, as you said, and one crate with your tackle. So let's go and unpack the uh, tackle crate first. So let's go and have a okay. look. Again, let's, let's do a quick snippet of that and uh, okay. show the guys what's in this crate. Preventing too much clutter means that I use crates like this one, and there's a little one at the bottom there with my, my baits and my hook baits and stuff in. Inside this crate is my entire live food, so I can go anywhere in the world with this one crate and I can fish 100%. I've got my buzzer ball back. Okay, Gilbert, so um, the next one is your crate with, uh, with baits. Um, just yes. before we get there, will it look different when we are doing a, a, uh, a summer session versus a winter session? Or will seasonality play a little bit of a part in this crate that you pack for baits? No, not at all. I think the thing that, that most South Africans don't quite realize and, and, and people look at the European video clips and then they, re, and they think, Yo, you know, there's a vast difference between summer and winter. But in South Africa, we really do not have such, such major differences. In, in our winter, we've got lovely sunshine days. We have almost windless days, maybe a, a, a light breeze here and there. So whatever I use in summer, I use in winter. And a beautiful exercise or an example of that was two years ago when I fished the Rurikopi's Winter Bonanza. I started the competition quite late. The competition started on Friday afternoon at six o'clock, but I only arrived at the lake at um, quarter to midnight because I had to go and attend a funeral. So, my day literally started just before sunrise, where most guys already had uh, six or eight hours worth of fishing in. I literally only be, uh, was able to drop my lines at about half past three, four o'clock in the morning. As it started getting light, I got the first run. And just as the sun set, I had my last run. And from the first run to the last run was 52 runs on four rods for the day. And it was absolute mayhem. I mean, I had a, f a fish on, my son had a fish on, then um, uh, Robert had a fish on, then Imre had a fish on. You know, it all, it, it was just incredible. And that was in the middle of winter. That was in June. We, 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 we did the winter bonanza. What I fed there and the way that I fished was exactly the same as when we did the Hirgan on Salvier which was in September last year. The only difference was for the winter one, for some other reason, the majority of my fish came on that single tiger nut with a um, orange foam or a purple foam that was just dipped in um, thalmaitan. And that's just a sweet solution. So you can use beetle and you can use um, the LL signature series, sunshine, whatever. And last year, at, on the Hirgan on Salvier, when we got there, obviously Skalken then wasn't there. So we didn't have the, the, the pandemonium and, and, and all of that, that only came at, on the, on the, on the uh, last part of the shoot. I only had the outrageous orange, uh, the, the, one of the quarter goose. And it was absolutely incredible. I mean, the fish just came and came and came and came. But I think the big secret was the salt. And that's something that I can mention to the, to the uh, viewers. For every 10 kilograms of uh, particles, I add one kilogram of coarse salt. But I don't, I don't let it dissolve in the feed. I actually put it in after, just before I go out to feed my, my bait. So I pour most of the water off. I add the salt, mix it through, and then I'm going to spread it over a wide area. Now, the whole theme or the theory of, uh, behind that is that I create a, a, a variation in the pH value on the lake bed. And when I put my highly flavored or highly sweetened hook bait in there, it's like a magnet for the fish because the very first thing that they encounter in that whole water column is that immense 
sweet or, or, or flavored uh, citrus flavor. And that's what that does the job. Yes, at Rudakopis, I could take some boilies, which I chopped up. But again, it was the essential IB from Mainline and the 50-50 Fritella, which, which I just put like just one, one handful over my hook bait. And, and it was like the fish were just having it um, without spooking one another. And we could see that. I mean, you went out with me on the boat and it was incredible to see how the fish were actually diving down. You could see it on the echo sound. Okay, great. So let's unpack what is in your crate uh, with respect to baits. Well, bait-wise, I also try and be as conservative as possible. So normally I've got a couple of tubs with various wafters and pop-ups that I've soaked in, in the quarter goose. I also don't like taking too many with me. Okay, thank you, Gilbert, for showing us the, um, the baits. So let's talk to rigs. This is the last component. Um, what do we take in terms of rigs and how do we prepare? Look, I'm, I'm very um, simple when it comes to, to, to those uh, sort of uh, things. I'll quickly show you here. The loops and booms. There it is. That's uh, a size 4 crank. And, I, and, and that piece of putty there is the most crucial part on that rig. Because what it does is the minute the fish sucks it up, that hook is, is free. And it literally targets the bottom lip every single time. Then, of course... Um, the faithful spinner rig. Um, I can fish this as a pop-up. I can fish it uh, lying on the bottom with just the, uh, the bait being critical. And this is pretty much it. Um, I don't mess about with too many other, other things. Yes, there's variations of the spinner, of the loops and booms. Here's one with a, a wide cape X size 4. It's got a little ring on. Um, so it's, it's a, it gives you that blowback um, effect. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, you During the South African waters, I, I literally only fish that. And I can chop and change with, with uh, a tiger nut, with um, either cork in or with a high-density foam in. I can fish a, 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 a boily. I've got one prep here that I can show you. Here's one that's, that's done as a snowman rig. The dark bait is a, is a bottom bait and the light one is a pop-up. So it literally just sits off the bottom. If I put my hand like that, it just sits like that, like a little snowman. And it all is done with two different rigs. So you don't need to be fancy. You also mentioned the chotty rig um, for silty bottoms. Yes, um, I've got a chod here. Now you can fish chods in, in a variety of ways. There it is. It's, um, this one is, a, is what we call a long chod. It's pretty much, I think it's about four and a half centimeters long. And, and it would literally, it's a hinge chod. So I can either cast this out or I can drop it with a boat and it will literally sit off the bottom like that. Um, and and uh, yeah, it, it does the job. That is literally what you need to do. Um, I can fish a low pop-up on the spinner so literally that hook will just sit off the bottom like that. Or I can fish the long chod with it sitting a little bit higher. Now it depends on how thick the silt is. And an a, a easy way of determining that is by just taking a heavy lead and tying a, a piece of wool, white wool preferably, to the, to the lead and just making a slip knot a little bit further up. And when you go out on the boat, you just free fall the lead the minute it, it, uh, it hits the bottom, it will obviously the lead will sink in and you just leave it for a couple of seconds and then you lift it out. And the area of from the lead to where the, the murkiness or the, 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 the silt actually penetrated, that is how thick that silt layer is. And that is how you determine whether you're going to be using a bottom bait or a wafter or a pop-up or a, a chart of, of some sort. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Gilbert. So I'll, I will be well prepared if I um, go out without taking too many things. For this lockdown period, give our viewers a few tips, uh, maybe two or three tips, what they can do during the lockdown time to make sure that when they get out, uh, it almost sounds like uh, some sort of a, a prison, but when we eventually get out, that we can put it to use. I think the most important thing is to, to all the lazy guys out there, the couch potatoes, there is so much to be seen on social media and on 
the four anglers um, website. I mean, there's literally hundreds of videos there. There is so much available on the Corda uh, YouTube channels. There is, uh, we've got the Kingfisher YouTube channel. So if you don't do specimen carp angling, you can see literally hundreds of videos on how to catch fish in the sea. Also how to prep. Um, you know, I'm going to be spending my time now making all the rigs that is really necessary for me to, to have and that I don't need to actually make them when, when we're out there. I'm going to be reading up and doing some research on, on, on dams that I want to be fishing as, as soon as we get out here. And the more information I can get together, the better, because it will just save me um, on, on preparation and all those sort of things. So what I'm, go, what I'm, what I'm asking the guys out there, obviously be as safe as possible, stick to the, to the rules government has set out, and build rigs. Um, if you don't know, there's so many other um, avenues that you can actually go and see how those rigs are being built. You know, I've, been, I've, I've done so many articles in the Carp Angler magazine to show you exactly how those rigs need to be constructed. And I don't put those rigs on there just to fill space. It is rigs that we actually use, and it's so efficient. So you have to try that. Then, of course, do a bit of exercise. I mean, you know, I need to lose a, a kilogram or two. And uh, what better way to, to get that done is, you know, get on the spinning bike like you did. You ran around the house. I can't run around my house, but I can get out the gate and I can run in the complex. So running around is, is, is almost 500 meters. So, and it's, and it's uphills and downhills and everything. So believe me, if, um, if I can just stick to it, you know, I'll probably get a, get a bit fitter and uh, lose a couple of kilos on the side as well. Okay, Gilbert, so uh, what we're going to do for a bit of fun, um, I'm going to ask you to shoot us a couple of the exercises that you uh, are going to do and share that with our viewers as well. So uh, well, the boys have already done that, unfortunately, so I think they have in secret already sent it to you. Okay, brilliant. So uh, we'll check that out and uh, show our viewers. Um, you also mentioned that another chat that we had, um, how your world of understanding what goes on be, um, below the waters have opened up um, by using the same equipment that you have done, but by getting a bit of expert advice. Tell us about that. Yes, um, one of my friends um, actually took some time and he really studied how the uh, Laurent's Elite 9 Ti2 actually functions. And we spent some time at Aqua Paradiso uh, about three weeks ago. And boy, oh boy, I mean, did that open up my mind to the possibilities that, that technology can, can give you. I mean, we knew there was a snag by swim number one, but when we went over there, after we did the software update and uh, Richard got all the settings sorted for me, the whole lot, I could actually see this entire tree lying on its side um, with roots sticking out on the one side, the branches on the other side. And I could actually see that the, the, there's an opening under that tree of about 67 inches, just right for a diver to put a sling around so we can pull that tree out. But what it actually does is it means that for all the guys out there that actually use that have got these uh, pieces of technology, go and study it uh, and, and work it out. And I think um, maybe Werner, if you can get someone like John Easton on uh, to have a chat about all the, all the experiments that he's been doing on, on mapping waters and the amazing results that you get from that. It's, it's like a new world opening up when you, when you actually see, but you know what, where I've been dropping my baits all this time, is, is literally two, three meters short of where it actually should have been. And, and that would be the difference between catching a hell of a lot more fish, uh, maybe bigger fish, and getting and, and get, get, get out of that zone where the smaller fish are, are patrolling. You know, there's so much that, that technology has got to its disposal that, that we haven't even tapped in yet. Oh, that, that's great. I'm also guilty of that. Um, we obviously have the state-of-the-art um, equipment on our boats and even on the, on the rubber ducks. But um, the failure to spend some good time understanding it um, gets you into a situation where you get out to the water and you're not op optimally or maximize the usage of it. 
So um, I think I'll take that uh, bit of advice as well and uh, also chat to these guys, get some um, good information and uh, also um, gear up my knowledge of um, the units that we have on the boats, which I think is, is pretty good. Now, the last question to you. So we get out of prison in the next 21 or 30 or however many days it is. Well, it will be needed to flatten the curve. The first fishing trip that you're going out to, what are you going to do? Well, um, I actually, I was actually supposed to now be on a wild water that I've never fished before. And this is the second time that I've had to postpone this trip. So I think if my boss would let me, the first thing I'll do is get there and do whatever I wanted to do. Now, I've prepared all the particles already, or the particles for the first two days. That's in the deep freeze. Um, I had to actually um, freeze them because I literally, as they were cooking, the announcement was, was made that we are going into lockdown. So I urgently had to send emails and, and cancel um, the booking, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, if, if, if I can, I'll definitely do that week session that I've uh, promised myself over a year ago. So that's number one. And number two, I'll go and do a session on Aqua Paradiso because I've seen some really interesting things on the Echo Sounder that I want to go and, first of all, go and um, check out properly, remap it, and then make a decision as to is it going to be the wild water or is it going to be Aqua Paradiso? Well, Gilbert, thank you for that and thank you for talking to us. And uh, I trust that our viewers have enjoyed it. Enjoy whatever you're doing. I must compliment you on the background that you've got there. Um, you. you certainly have enough equipment to keep yourself busy with. You've set up uh, and it looks like somewhere in your garage, but um, it looks quite a nice and a professional studio. So uh, you can enjoy yourself there. And thank you for talking to us. And we'll catch 100%. up to you again sometime in the future. Thank you so much, Werner. And to all our viewers, uh, we will be back tomorrow. We will speak to another interesting personality. Uh, so keep on watching for Anglers. And uh, stay tuned every afternoon between 5 and 6 uh, for another episode of Online With. You can do some cycling. It really keeps the mind active and the blood flowing. And what about some abs? And some kettlebells. And some bicep curls. And then you pushed. Swiss and Clark.